Welcome to Ibona Origin Stories, the space podcast where we look to bring you extraordinary leaders from within the sector and their fascinating stories of early life, career and how they broke into the space industry. Today on the podcast, we are joined by Brian Manning, the CEO and co-founder of Zona Space Systems. As a self-proclaimed tinkerer from a very early age, Brian's dream of becoming an engineer was already solidified in kindergarten. We discussed the influence of his family's plumbing business in his early life, and how he took his hands-on skills from Lego to real tools as he discovered his passions for hardware and building. Since then, he has worked on some incredible and very diverse projects that have shaped both his outlook on the space sector and his place within it today. He worked for huge industry names like SpaceX before founding Zona Space Systems, who are an amazing company developing the most accurate and secure real-time PNT service on the planet. We're really excited to dive deeper into this today as we explore Brian's story. Hey, Brian, how you doing? Hey, Rich, good. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. How's things? I'm a busy morning already. Busy. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Cool. Well, look, thanks for taking the time to, to come on the show today. Really, really appreciate it. Thanks for coming on. Sure. No, thank you for inviting us. Good. Good. So it's all right with you. We'll just kind of dive right into this thing. That's cool. Yeah, all right. Excellent. Well, again, thanks for taking the time to join us. I appreciate you're busy. If it would be all right with you, um, we'd like to start back from the early days of Brian Manning. Talk us through where you started in life, where you grew up, school, college, and eventually how you sort of found your way into your early career at PSI and SpaceX. Sure. Okay. I guess we're going all the way back then. Um, let's see. So I'm, I'm from a very small town up north, uh, very rural Michigan. Um, it's a town of 20,000 people, and that is like the biggest town for a three-hour drive in any direction. Okay. Um, so I, I grew up very much deep in the snow as an ice hockey player. Um, and I, I grew up in a family that was small business owners. And so our family owned a, a plumbing shop. Um, and that was most of my, so most of my early life, I was a plumber. Um, <laughs> so, you know, grew up helping out in the, the family plumbing shop, building stuff, building buildings, um, plumbing. So, you know, I could still plunge a toilet better than most people, but, um, and as I was growing up, I kind of started working on other just tinkering projects with, with family and, uh, with my grandpa working summers. And uh, my grandpa was an engineer who, um, I mean, he was one of the old school engineers that was just kind of scrappy, could fix anything. And um, so it kind of went from you know, working on houses to starting to work in things in the garage. And I mean, it really went, I guess, you, know, you say start with, started with Legos, then started working with real tools, then started working in garage stuff. Um, I think even if you look at like, when we did my high school graduation thing, we found the board of like, you know, in kindergarten, what did you want to be? And it already said engineer on there. <laughs> so I think I've been, I've been a, a tinker like my entire life. Um, and I, I just expanded from Legos to wrenches to garage stuff. Um, and you know, I've always had kind of, I would say a, a passion for building cars and motorcycles and, and things like that. And that just kind of kept expanding. And so, you know, went to, went off to school for, for engineering, um, then worked on a whole lot of wacky stuff along the line. So I've had internships working on everything from, muon catalyzed fusion to nuclear rockets to um you know hiking around colorado working on snow measuring stations and i've seen a lot of different cool stuff um but i've been kind of kept coming back to uh, like i have a passion for hardware and, and building things that do things yeah um and so my, my first job out of school um was in the automotive industry that always kind of seemed to make sense because like, you know, i've got a passion for a built you know race cars, race motorcycles for, for a long time now. And so the car scene now seemed like it fit and it was fun, but it wasn't, I guess, as fulfilling. Um, and then after PSI, I got an opportunity to go work at SpaceX. Um, that was my first entry into the, the space world and the space sector. And I think just kind of fell in love with it. Um, and so, you know, went from there, um, off to back to do an MBA, kind of chasing the entrepreneurial side of, you know, I mean, grew up in a very family business side of things i've always had that kind of bone and um shortly after there started started um started zona here with a bunch of buddies um and so yeah i've been been kind of a space nut and um you know excited about the space world and the impact it can make ever since then so amazing that's that's quite a pedigree going from plumbing building tinkering through to vehicles automotive all the way right the way through to to space i mean they're all just kind of a expansion one on the other right i mean yeah it's 
you know, you're going from Lego blocks to building things out of plastic to building things out of metal to building bigger, cooler things out of metal, pretty much. <laughs> Amazing. I guess now that now that you're kind of in the space sector, have been in the space sector for a number of years now, SpaceX now building your own company. Now that you're kind of in it and living it, what do you what do you love most about the space sector? What made you kind of fall in love with it and and stay in it? Oh yeah, uh, I mean, so a big part of it is just the people that you know. We have a, a phenomenal yeah. team. A very it's exciting to see what a group of very motivated and passionate people can do when you know, their interests are are aligned. And that was true at SpaceX, and that's very true here at Zona too. Um, but I think that what what excites people, and what's I guess where some of my excitement is, is that we for, space is like the most cutting edge technology out there in many ways. Um, and there are a lot of cool technologies and, and whatnot, but space has always been one of those you know, kind of leading edge type things. Um, but at the end of the day, space is, space is in many ways just a geographical location. Um, it's just a geographical location that has some very unique aspects to it. And in many ways, I think space is as useful as, you know, these services it can provide to, you know, people on earth and humanity in general. And I think that the superpower of space is scalability. And, you know, with satellites specifically, you know, you can, with a relatively small infrastructure, build something that can affect literally every single person on the planet. And there's really not, there's not many things that can do that. I mean, you know, ocean, were once you know this great thing that can let humanity expand and space is just another expansion that um you know allows let's say a limited amount of effort but a limited amount of infrastructure to you know that's part of the beauty of our system is that you know we can we can build a system that can legitimately impact billions of people um with only a say only a couple hundred satellites it sounds like a lot to some people but it's a pretty small um small overall footprints and it's just really leveraging that you know, the superpower of scalability that that is what the space sector can bring i think okay yeah no, absolutely and if it's okay would you mind just telling our listeners a bit about what zone of space systems do how they fit into the space sector and also it'd be good if you could talk us through where you where you see the the company being in the next five years yeah sure i guess it kind of covered my background so i can cover a little more on the zona background and where where we came from and where that all started also um so I guess zona was founded by we we're actually founded by eight people it's kind of a large founding team um and a lot of it traces back to our, our cto dr tyler reed um so most of the founders we all met back at stanford doing grad school in aero astro um we all did our master's degree together and then after that everyone kind of split and went their different direction um, you know, personally, I went like I said into the automotive world, then back into the SpaceX world. Um, Tyler, I guess, wanted a, a little more punishment, so he stuck around to do a PhD, um, <laughs> and he did his PhD on essentially how you would use what's going on in the new space world, you know, these large constellations of small satellites, and how you could use that to build you know, effectively a new generation of, of GPS. Um, and so it, that was his, you know, PhD. Um, and I think that was published, that some of that work was published back in kind of 2015, 2016. And when, when you graduate with a PhD, you have something that, you know, could be a world changing idea, but a lot of times you may not know, okay, is there a, is there a real world need? You know, is there a real problem out there that this, that this solves? And so after uh, Stanford, Tyler went to work at Ford in their autonomous vehicle division um, out in California. And Part of his job there was essentially technology scouting and you know, looking at it in industry and seeing you know what what technologies are available to support the coming world of you know autonomous cars and drones and you know, robotic operation and, and things like that. Um, and that's where he really started to kind of realize the gap between where where GPS is today and where it you know, needs to be and where satellite navigation really needs to be to support the, you know, the accuracy, the integrity, the reliability demands of these modern applications. And you know, I don't want to take anything away from GPS. GPS is a just phenomenal system. I mean, it, it creates, most people think of GPS as you know, just a little blue dot on your phone. Not many people realize that it creates like into the trillions of dollars of value every year and that everything in the world depends on GPS these days. It's like this just massive invisible utility that every form of transportation whether it's trains planes trucks ships automobiles um all rely on it all of our national infrastructure relies on it banking grids everything relies on it um but 
um, you know, there, GPS was, was designed, you know, for kind of a previous generation of technology. It, it is modernizing, um, but the, the demands from modern technology are, are just evolving so fast that it's very difficult for the, you know, the big, you know, the legacy government systems to keep up. And so that's what, you know, Retire was kind of recognizing this gap. Um, and that's where we kind of started to put the pieces together and say, okay, you know, with what's going on in the new space era, we believe we can use you know, a lot of this kind of technology that's been being developed in this ecosystem of small satellites and you know, lower cost launch to develop a, a new, you know, effectively super GPS system is kind of the best way to think of it, specifically designed to support you know, autonomous vehicles and, and drones, robotics and all these applications by providing um, you know, extremely high accuracy, extremely high integrity, you know, taking lessons from military security, lessons from civil aviation safety, um, even lessons from like precision agriculture and really high accuracy and putting this all together into kind of this super system. Um, and that generally found that, it, you know, if you can meet the requirements for autonomous cars, you can meet the requirements for just about everything. And so, you know, really believe that going forward, you start to see Zona as something that, you know, is this extremely high, high performance satellite navigation, you know, specifically designed to support the really demanding applications. But that also means, if you look down the road, what what can you do when you you know unleash reliable centimeter level performance on the world of app, app designers and smartphones? Um, in the same way that you know, GPS was never designed necessarily to tell a taxi cab where it's at, but without it, Uber doesn't exist. And so, what can you do when you start to give you know the world this much better capability? That I think we're still really just even seeing the tip of the iceberg as to what really reliable high accuracy per, you know navigation can do for the world. Amazing, excellent. No, thanks for thanks for sharing that. And the well, the the next thing I actually want to talk to you about is is it's kind of linked around talent and actually finding people to sustain yeah. the space sector. And one of the biggest, I guess, sort of motivations for us actually starting this whole podcast is to try to make space accessible for everyone. One of the hot topics yeah. now across the industry is is the constant constant battle for for good talent. So what we've been doing to kind of try and play our small part is things like this podcast we're all registered stem ambassadors but we want to try and impact change at a much younger age across stem and steam to make sure we're sustaining that sort of growth in years to come yep. we don't just run out of run out of people to actually keep the, the industry going so what do you feel we should be doing differently across the industry and at sort of stem level and sort of younger generation to try and impact that change now and for future generations yeah i think i think there's a couple of things i mean one of them is, is, is kind of like I mentioned earlier, just connecting connecting space to Earth. And and I think I remember the Super Bowl commercials last year that there was a lot of ones kind of giving, uh, putting some heat on the space sector of saying like, oh, all these billionaires are just wasting their money. Like yeah, the sales on these sales yeah rockets commercial, yeah. and toys and things like that in space. And I think we really have to connect space to Earth and say, you know, space space has this kind of you know holier than thou look to it, but really what it's what it's here for and what it's useful for is what are the services it can provide to earth? And you know, can you use space to provide internet and connectivity to all the people that aren't connected in the world? Can you use it to make, you know, bring the benefits of autonomous vehicles and make them safer and, you know, enable them to expand into snowy areas and rainy areas and, you know, areas where human drivers can't go or aren't safe enough to go. Um, and what else can you use space for that can really make big impacts here on earth and, and use that kind of, again, the superpowers of, of space and that scalability and you know, connecting the space segment to the real value that it can create and the benefits that it can bring humanity on, on earth. Um, I think the other aspect is just kind of humanizing it. And if you look at the, the Apollo era, you always think of like the people that designed the Saturn V are just like, you know, they're not like you and me, right? They're different. They're, they think on a different level. They work on a different level. Like, you know, the astronauts back then, they, they're not, you know, they're almost like unhuman. They're just these unbelievable kind of, you know, godlike creatures. Um, but when you dig into it, I mean, you've been working inside SpaceX, you know, working on satellites here. Every wire's got two ends. Every bolt turns left or right. I mean, at the end of the day, it's it's not that, different from you say automotive it's not that different from a lot of other things i mean there's yes there's stricter requirements there's other considerations there's other things you have to take into account um but they're all they're all learnable and once you break it down to its core components a rocket is you know 
metal and wires and, and, and silicon and, and fuel um, in many ways. And it's the same way that if you break a, a car down to its components that you, you someone put every bolt in that thing and you know someone put every bolt in that rocket. Um, and so it's, I think, Anyone who's you know afraid of the space or, or concerned that you know they're not you know maybe not good enough or up to the challenge or haven't learned enough in school, I don't think that's true. You just got to dig in and dive in and, and go. And you know there's a lot of really good, really sharp people that you can learn from um, already out there. And I think that's the best way to learn is just get involved and, and go with it. No, absolutely. I think humanizing it and making it relatable are the things that really stand out to me there. I think a part of our <clears throat> our onboarding here at Vayner when we hire people is that they become a they enroll to become a STEM ambassador. So they need to participate or yeah. or actually run a STEM event to do this kind of stuff and to to educate the young generation. But I think the, the yep. biggest piece there you mentioned is to make it relatable. Because if you start going and talking to to kids about you know rockets and space systems, all that kind of stuff, is actually what can I use or what can I utilize to talk about to make it relatable to that person? So things like cars, exactly like you said there, and saying that it's not that different, it's accessible for everyone. So yeah, I couldn't couldn't agree more. And the that kind of leads us on to the next thing around um failures and achievements or less or lessons learned, shall I say. So I think with Again, we're kind of talking about the young generation now, but with like the various social media platforms that you see, people always see the kind of the the highlight reels of success and achievements yeah. and sort of like the end goal. They don't see the sacrifice and the grind leading up to that. So I guess throughout your life career, what would you what would you consider so far as your biggest lesson learned? And what did you learn from that failure? And on the other side of that fence, what would you consider so far your biggest achievement career to date? So I'd say one of the biggest career failures personally was chasing a paycheck. And you know, a, a big part of the reason that I, I took the first job wasn't because I was necessarily, I mean, it did seem it was automotive. It did seem like it had some alignments, but um, it was also you know, numerically the best offer I had. Um, and I think I put a lot of weight on that um, and I put a lot more value on dollar signs than I did on your know, value of life and enjoyment. And I guess the just kind of fulfillment you get out of being happy and enjoying what you're doing and, and feeling a real connection and um, with, with what you're doing in life. And I think I've, I've learned that lesson perhaps the hard way um, that, you know, ever since then, you know, I remember my interview at SpaceX and they asked, you know, what are, what do you want? Um, or why are you interested? And my immediate answer was, was I want to enjoy my life. Um, and I want to feel like what I'm doing is really making making a big difference. And I think that's very much been pursuing that, you know, through the SpaceX career and very much with, with Zona now as well. Um, and I've carried that over into very much into the values of the, the company here is that um, you know, really we believe in what we're doing, but more importantly, we believe why we're doing it and why we're doing it is not to go get rich or chase a paycheck. We're doing it because we believe in what Zona can do and the differences that we really believe we can make um you know for i guess called sounds cheesy to say humanity but you know to enhance the human experience and our, our company mission is all formed around enabling you know, modern technology to operate safely in any condition anywhere on earth and you know, we're big believers in you know the i guess efficiency um and benefits that things like autonomous systems can bring to the world but to be able to really do that they need to operate safely and they need to operate safely anywhere all the time and that you need to feel as safe getting into autonomous vehicles you do getting into you know a, a you know an, an airliner to to go take a, a trip across the country or overseas and so that's really kind of what drives us is you know bringing those benefits out um and so yeah i'd say that's definitely one of my failures is don't 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 chase a paycheck like you will yeah. if you if you chase if you follow your effort um I think the, the paycheck will certainly follow, but if you go the other way around, it's very unlikely that if you chase a paycheck, your efforts just magically going to show up to, to, to back it. Um, that's the biggest career achievement is kind of come once I figured out how to flip that direction around. Um, <laughs> launching the, the first satellite here at Zona, um, I would say is, that's, that's, I've got a lot of, you know, highlight real memories. Um, you know, from you know, being outside the control center, watching Falcon Heavy come back and land and knowing I was a part of that. But um, being in the room with the Zona team, watching that first satellite take off and make it into space, um, you know, knowing that that is something that you know, we went from, you know, an idea to a ground test. And in less than a year from ground test, we you know, designed, built and launched our first satellite um, with one of those just 
amazing and, and passionate group of people I've, I've ever gotten the opportunity to work with um, and knowing that, you know, it's played my, my role in, in some part of that and in helping organize and, and drive it. Um, that, that's a, that's a lifetime memory. I'll, I'll, I'll never forget. And I think that's one of our biggest career. I would say that's my biggest career achievement to date is um, playing, playing my role and, and being a part of that. That must've been an incredible feeling. So the control center with that reached into space. That's yeah. That was pretty fun watching. I mean, we 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 had a little party downtown here in San Mateo. Um, yeah, everyone standing around watching the Falcon take off, and then watching the satellite actually deploy. And it was pretty pretty fulfilling feeling watching that happen and knowing that that's you know we we did that. Um, and yeah, very 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 exciting day. <laughs> yeah, I think I think very well said as well on chasing the pound signs or the dollar signs. It's um. It's, it's a quick route to, to being very, very unhappy. I think money can serve a purpose and give you a platform to get where you need to be, but essentially has a shelf life at the end of the day. It's all about having a purpose, isn't it, um, to drive you on beyond that. So, yeah, I couldn't agree more. And um, what would you, the, again, going back to, I guess, the, the whole ethos of this show and why we did it is we want to make it as sort of insightful, but also resourceful for people that are listening into this that may be completely disengage from the space sector or people that may be outside of the sector that look at the the industry as just completely unreachable and something they could never possibly achieve so what would you what would you kind of say over the years of the best resources that that you've identified and utilized whether that be courses or programs or mentors or whatever it is has kind of helped you segue into the space sector so never underestimate the power of networking yeah um uh, I've learned that from a, a lot of people that you know, sending an email, picking up the phone, using you know, your LinkedIn connections. There's a lot of people um, that, I mean, myself included, everyone got here. We didn't get here on our own. Like I, I, I didn't get to where I am and I didn't get to, to Zona on my own. That I've, I've had a lot of help along the way. And I think that's probably true of everyone that works here is that we have, there's been you know, helpers, they've been, they've been mentors. And I think for each person that they've come from different places, but it, it's all folks that are within, within your network one way or another. Um, I know that there are, you know, I think we, I've, we've met people at, you know, just kind of meetup events, you know, for, for space industry. Um, I've met people through, through school. I've met people through work. Um, you know, just people that you maybe went to, to college with. Um, a lot, I've met a lot of very friendly, very open people in the space segment um and you know in general most folks in the space world are, are looking for good people are excited to get more talent more um awareness and more people in into the space world i mean even if it's not directly at you know say the company they're working at but everyone in the space segment you know, we, you know i know however many other companies that if someone came to me and said hey really looking to get involved you know didn't see any posting us on your website but you know, do you know of anything? There's probably 10 other companies that we, we would be interested to send folks over to. And, and likewise, we've had other folks ping over to us. And so, um, yeah, I'd, I'd say, you know, utilize your, your network, whether that's LinkedIn, whether it's, you know, family, friends, college friends, et cetera. And don't be afraid to send an email. Uh, it's yeah. it, the worst you can, the worst you can do is not get a response back. Right? So. <laughs> no, absolutely. And our final question, kind of our, our, our question I'd like to sort of close out the show with, and you've kind of already give um, some some touches of gold here, but for some that person again that I was referring to that, and they, they could be anyone, doesn't have to be an engineer, it could be someone in sales or marketing or uh, program management, supply chain, whatever it is. If someone is outside of the industry looking in at us now and wanting to get into the space sector, but they feel like it's a bridge too far, it's not accessible, they think it's all astronauts and rockets. What advice would you give for that person or anyone looking to enter in to the space sector in 2022 and beyond? Yeah, for sure. I, I would say look at the small companies. Um, you know, the, the big companies, I mean, so, you know, SpaceX was a, was a great place to work. I learned a lot there. That being said, they're, it's very competitive that they have thousands and thousands of applications. And so, um, you know, sometimes it's, it's, it's possible that, you know, your application would be, it's tough to come to the, the top of the stack and that's no fault of the other you know, recruiters there or anything. It's just, there's a lot of folks there where, you know, smaller companies, if you're reaching out directly, um, you know, there's a lot of great companies that you can, you know, learn a hell of a lot from very fast yeah. um, and that are really looking for good people. And a lot of these small companies, even, you know, like Zona are places where you can, 
you know, a, a single person's impact can be massive that you can help drive the entire direction of the company and own, I mean, anything from you know, an entire component to an entire system on a, on a satellite or a rocket or whatnot. Um, I think it, it's easy to be attracted to just the, the big names, but it's definitely worth it to, you know, if you're, if you're sending an email out or, and looking at the, the smaller companies, um, you may not have as much recruiting power, um, but that also means that, you know, th we may only have a, a limited number of, of applicants for a certain role. Um, so it's much more likely to, um, you know, I guess have your name come to the, the, the top of the pile, for example, um, or at least start to, to crack in and have conversations uh, with, with the smaller companies. And, uh, you know, once, once you're in, you have an opportunity to go in many different um, kind of directions from there, but it's, it's if nothing else, a way to get, get in the door. Um, and again, for, from us, that's as, as the smaller companies, we, we hope if someone gets in the door with us, that's our job to, you know, retain them and keep them excited and yeah. uh, sticking around <laughs> long-term. Um, and I, you know, as, I do think there's a lot that the, the smaller space companies have, have to offer um and just a lot of excitement and like i said there's something to be said for being part of a just this really small passionate team that's all driving the same direction um and so yeah certainly worth looking at the larger companies but don't don't ignore the smaller ones and, and take a look around and see that there's a lot of a lot of great companies out there doing a lot of exciting things um you know some of them are just a little bit more under the radar so you can agree more excellent well, that concludes our show. Brian, thanks ever so much for taking the time to come on today. Really, really appreciate it. It's been great having you on. We'll speak to you again in the future. Awesome. Thanks so much for your time, Rich. Excellent. Thanks, Brian.